Listen now for the word of the Lord. Jesus said, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory, which you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I remember the first time I attended a Catholic mass. I was in high school. I had been raised, as you know, in a little Methodist, very Protestant church. And this experience at the mass was eye-opening for me. My friend Ward Powell invited me to attend the Mass with him. I don't know why. There must have been some special reason for me to attend that Mass, but I was glad to go. About half the town that I was raised in were Catholics. I knew a, a lot of people in the church, but it was the first time I had ever been inside that church and attended the Mass. Now, the problem was that my friend Ward had a broken leg. In fact, just a few days earlier, in a junior varsity football game, Ward had his leg broken when we were playing against the New Berlin Pretzels. That's right, the mighty and fearful New Berlin Pretzels. Well, now you might not think it's a big deal that my friend had a broken leg, but it was a big deal to me in my first Catholic Mass because he was supposed to be the one that showed me when to stand up, sit down, and kneel and do all the things you have to do in a Catholic Mass. He couldn't do any of those. He was seated because of his broken leg. I remember the first time I saw everybody kneel, and I saw the kneeler, and I threw it down and went clack, and everybody looked at me. I knew that I was doing it wrong. There were lots of things that bewildered me. I I remember shortly after I sat down, somebody that I knew came in, went down the center aisle. I found out later they were genuflecting. I thought they slipped and were falling. I stood up to go help them, and then I realized they were falling all over the sanctuary, and I sat back down in my seat. There were just lots of things for me to learn in my first Catholic Mass. But one of the things that stood out to me was the fact that for much of the Mass, the priest had his back to the sanctuary. The priest was talking to God, with the sanctuary behind him, I mean, the congregation behind him, and and if the congregation wanted to know what was going on, they had to kind of lean in and listen, overhear what the priest was saying to God on their behalf. Growing up in that little Methodist church, our preacher would never have turned his back on the congregation. I guess he was afraid we might make some faces or something. I don't know. I've often been tempted to whirl around quickly to see if the choir was making any faces, but I've never really done that. It was just odd for me to think about so much of the service being spent with the priest having his back to the congregation, and we had to over here, we had to listen in. It wasn't until much later in the course of my studies that I realized that that is the priest's job. The priest, by definition, whether it's in the Hebrew scriptures in the temple throughout the ages, the, the priest's job is to be an intermediary, to stand between the people and God, to speak to God on behalf of the people and to speak to the people on behalf of God. That is the priest's job. And so when the priest turned his back to us, 
He was speaking on our behalf to God, inviting us to lean in and listen. Starting in the 13th chapter of John's gospel, we have what scholars call the farewell discourse. This is Jesus' goodbye to his disciples. It's the longest section of Jesus speaking of anywhere in the scriptures, and he has a lot to say before he leaves. In this section, he tries very hard to summarize his teachings, his preaching, his ministry over probably about three years, and the disciples need to pay attention to get clear what it is that Jesus wants them to hear before he goes. And then the 17th chapter, the last chapter of this farewell discourse, the scholars call the high priestly prayer. Jesus figuratively, perhaps literally, turns his back on his disciples and offers the prayer to God. Now, it's interesting, in the 17th chapter, Jesus begins by praying on behalf of his current disciples, the people who have responded to him, who have followed him in his ministry in Galilee and in the Jerusalem region. But at the beginning of our passage for today, Jesus shifts the focus a little bit to pray for those who will be believers in the future for those who will come to believe because of the work of these disciples. In other words, Jesus is praying for us. He's praying for the church throughout history and the church today with his back towards us. As the priest, Jesus speaks to God on our behalf and we're invited to lean in and listen. What did you hear? I'm going to be honest, I'm not particularly thrilled about what Jesus prayed for. Jesus prayed that the church, that we across the globe, across the centuries, that the church might be one, one big happy family getting along with each other. But I got to confess to you, there are some Christians I don't really like. There are some whose theology rubs me the wrong way. I just can't find myself agreeing with them. Whose politics are so in your face and blatant and abrasive that I just, I just struggle with being around them. And some of them are just mean and I'd rather not be one with them there's some Christians I just don't really like I like most of you but there are other people that I don't particularly care for I wish Jesus hadn't prayed that Bob Green is a columnist he wrote a column a number of years ago about the last time he remembered crying. He said, I was in junior high school and I tried out for the basketball team. Well, the day came to announce who made the basketball team. At the end of school, I made my way down to the gym and there on the wall was the sheet of paper of the boys who made the team. He said, the coach was not particularly discreet in how he made the list. It was clear that the best players were at the top and they got worse as the list went along. But I kept thinking, maybe down near the bottom, my name would be there, but it wasn't. I'd been cut. He said, I held it together at school, okay, but I got home and I started sobbing in this little town where I lived, in this little school where I attended, if you were on the basketball team, you were a big deal. But if you weren't, you might as well not even be alive. And I'd been cut. You know, I feel sorry for Bob. But I wonder, maybe that's the problem with the church. We don't cut anybody. We don't let anybody go. We just open the doors. Let them all come in. All of them. 
They don't have to pass a test. They don't have to agree with me or you or anybody. They can be ornery and mean as heck. We just open the doors and let them come in. You know, for 41 years as pastor of a church, I have allowed people to join the church any Sunday they want. Just come on down. Just come down. You bring a membership card. I'll receive you into the life of this church. No test, no rules, no requirements. If you feel called by God, you just come on down and join the church. And I've had multiple people over the years say to me, you know, if you do that, anybody can join. I guess they're right. Maybe you ought to rethink that here at the end of my ministry. But then I lean in. I overhear what Jesus is saying. And I understand that Jesus is not saying love everybody so that the church is a big happy place. Love everybody so you're not uncomfortable. Love everybody so that there's a feeling of smoothness and peace. No, he says, I want you to love each other because that's the only way the world is going to know what God is like. We don't love each other to make this an easy place to be. We love each other because God is counting on us to show the world the love of God. Fred Craddock is a magnificent preacher, was a magnificent preacher and teacher. He was teaching a class on the Gospel of Luke. And then it was one more story in Luke's Gospel about some poor soul being loved and cared for by Jesus or one of his disciples. He said in the middle of this lecture, a member of the class, a young man, slammed his book shut, got up and walked to the back door. He turned around at the door and looked at us and said, that's the problem with you Christians. You keep stopping to pick up your cripples. No army can march to victory if it keeps stopping to pick up their cripples. And he stormed out. Maybe he's right. But if you lean in and listen to Jesus, he says we are called to love one another, whether we agree, whether we like each other, whether we get along, not for our sakes, not for your sake, not for my sake, but for the sake of the world. How are they going to know who God is if they do not see it in us? The great preacher David Lose says that this understanding of God, this understanding of the church is wrapped up in our doctrine of baptism. Now, there are those traditions who require you to be old enough to understand what's going on. They require you to be old enough to make your own faith claim, to to say, this is what I believe, and I'm making my decision for Christ, and I'm choosing to be a part of the church. He said, but not our tradition. In our tradition, we do something rather unusual. We bring a baby down front, and before that baby can do anything to earn, deserve, understand, make sense of this church thing, of this God thing, we baptize them, and we say, now God loves you. God loves you. Before you can do anything to understand or make sense of this Christian faith, God loves you. You're a part of the family. Welcome here. God loves you whether you like it or not. David Lowe said, I preached that sermon. And then a couple weeks later, I had a young father come up to me at the end of one of the services said, the funniest thing happened a couple days ago, Dr. Lowe. He said, I was putting our little boy to bed. He's a little over two years old, and he did not want to go to bed. And we were fighting about him going to bed. And finally, I just said, you are going to bed, young man. And he looked at me and said, Daddy, I hate you. I said, well, you do? Well, I love you. So don't say that, Daddy. <laughs> I hate you. Well, that's okay. But I love you. No, Daddy, stop saying that. I hate you. And he said, I looked at my boy and said, Son, I love you whether you like it or not. That's what God says to us. God says, I I love you whether you like it or not. And that's the message we are called to give to the world And it's not easy. 
Todd was right. That's, that's why you come to church every week to practice. To practice on each other. It's not always easy, but we practice on each other. Don't look down the pew. You know who I'm talking about. Some of you are hard to love. But we're going to get to figuring out how to love in here so that when we go out there, the world can hear the message that God says, I love you whether you like it or not. But that's hard. I mean, I mean how do we get there? How, how, do we, how do we find that place in our souls and in our lives? Well, if you lean in and listen again, Jesus says, I pray that you might be in me and that I might be in you. Now, I don't know what that means, but it might mean something like this. If we keep hanging around this Jesus guy in worship and prayer and study and service and community and fellowship, if we keep hanging around this Jesus guy, it might just rub off on us a little bit. Years ago, I heard one of the great Presbyterian preachers of the last century, Dr. Ian Pitt Watson. He was preaching at the uh, First Presbyterian Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Magnificent preacher. I'll never forget one story he told. He said that when he was a young man, he was awkward uh, socially and physically. But there was this girl that he had his eye on. He said, I, I realized that my, my, my fellow brothers who could dance did a little better with the girls. So I figured out I needed to learn how to dance. So being a scholar and an academic, you know what I did? I went to the library and checked out a book entitled, How to Teach Yourself to Dance. I got home with the book and, and I opened it up and inside were those black footprints that you put on the floor. They told me what music to play and I put it on, sort of 1930s ballroom dancing and I would take that book and every night I'd put my foot on those footprints and I'd try to remember where they go so I could learn how to dance. Well, I had it up here, but it wasn't very graceful. The night came for the next dance, and lo and behold, he said, that young woman came up and asked me if I would dance with her. Well, I'm going through my mind, trying to remember where my hands go, where my feet go, where my next steps were. And they started the music, and we started to dance. And it was a little awkward at first, but pretty soon her grace wore off on me and I could find myself moving freely and smoothly because of her grace. If we keep hanging around this Jesus guy, who knows? Maybe we can learn to love each other, love others in the church, Maybe even love the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our final hymn to